Well, it was a jam-packed week for the financial markets last week. 25 basis point hikes coming from the Fed and the ECB, plus a tweak to yield curve control from the Bank of Japan as well. Plenty of monetary policy developments and plenty going on elsewhere as well, with earnings season continuing and some beats on the big tech side of things and a jam-packed macroeconomic slate as well. Amid all of that, equities continuing to rally, the S&P 500 gaining for a third straight week, if I can get my words out, and the dollar continuing to rebound as well. It's another busy week this week as July wraps up and August gets underway. The Bank of England deciding policy non-farm payrolls due out of the US and earnings from Apple and Amazon in the mix as well. It's another busy episode of the Trade-Off UK this week. So without further ado, let's get into the show. So plenty for us to discuss on the trade-off this week. Uh, An interesting allegation was thrown at us last week from a man in Phoenix, Arizona, saying that Ryan Littlestone and I are, quote, unquote, bad people. Ryan, what on earth should we make of that, mate? I don't know. I I think it's disgraceful behaviour. You know, these are are two old old school people of the markets, you know, and here they are giving us, uh, telling us we're bad people. You know, we, we all have to live up to that, I think, today, mate. Exactly that. And to be honest, if I had a dodgy haircut like Blake or a faux Aussie accent like Westy, I would not be taking the mick out of anyone. You know, those in those in glass houses shouldn't throw stones, as they rightly say. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. They need to watch themselves. We're, we're coming for them. Oh, we certainly are. I mean, look at the viewing figures. Look at the track record on plays of the day. Uh, we're nipping at their heels. But anyway, let's get into the meat of the show. Now, Ryan is with me and get on to Topical Thunder. So uh, there's only really one place to start now we've addressed those slanderous allegations coming from the uh, other side of Pepperstone, um, and that is with the central bank decisions that we had uh, last week. Now, of course, the Fed, the ECB, and the Bank of Japan, I think we um, we were speaking last week about which might be uh, the most impactful for the markets. And uh, I guess you can certainly discount the Fed when it comes to uh, what had a, a significant impact on financial markets last week. Uh, Jay Powell and co sticking very much to the script, raising rates by 25 basis points as we expected. There was just one real change to the uh, policy statement from that delivered in June, and that changed the uh, description of economic growth to moderate compared to modest. And I think that's probably just because the bloke writing the statement got bored rather than anything significant. Um, Still hawkish, maintaining a tightening bias. It's a data-dependent approach. Um, I think it was interesting that Powell refused to say that policy is sufficiently restrictive. I still think uh, that a hike in either September or November is on the table. Uh, But of course, we will wait and see. And and that depends largely on how hot the incoming economic data proves. I think the other two central bank decisions are more interesting. The ECB, they also raised rates by 25 basis points, the deposit rate now equaling a record high at three and three quarter percent. But uh, President Lagarde was very, very dovish in the post-meeting press conference, refusing a couple of times to repeat the previous line that there's more ground to cover in terms of rates and stressing that she's open-minded in terms of what the ECB do in September. And then, of course, you had the Bank of Japan, which, you know, you can spin either way, really, this idea of tweaking Yield curve control, previously 0.5% on the 10-year JGB was a hard cap or a rigid limit, as the BOJ called it. That's now a reference, and they've effectively said they're going to let uh, JGBs move above that level, but the 1% is where they will conduct buying operations. So you assume their sort of tolerance lies somewhere between the two. You could argue it's hawkish. First step towards policy normalization. Some of the sources reports we've seen in the aftermath have stressed that. But then you can also argue that it's dovish. And that's exactly what Governor Ueda did at his post meeting press conference, really saying that this tweak is not a step towards normalization. And what it actually is, is a move to enhance what he called the sustainability of policy easing. So plenty in the mix there, Ryan. What did you make of it all, mate? Yeah. If if Fitz Powell was a was a cat and he walked along the top of the fence perfectly well, you know, he, every time he gave something you could construe hawkish, he added something that was less so, and he kept it straight down the line. 
we know where these guys are at. We might get one more hike, but otherwise, unless the data really turns against them, they're done uh, with hikes. The ECB, it's almost a mirror image of, of Powell before they had the June pause. Um, similar type of thing. We, we think we might get another one. Some in the ECB still pushing for, for perhaps a September hike. So there's still a bit of a, a battle to be had there, probably more so than uh, at the FOMC. But like you said, the guard didn't want to give out anything hawkish on on that front. Um, they both said similar things. Powell said policy was restrictive. Um, that gives you the clue on on the the Dovey side. But then the guard said she wouldn't rule out uh, going at uh, you know consecutive meetings. And and Powell issued the same sort of talk as well. So it's all keeping the door open to further hikes if they need to. But you know, I know, the market knows we're probably at the most one hike from being done. And it's not likely to be a pause. It's likely to be a top. Um, as for the Bank of Japan, well, they went to uh, pretty much my base case, my base case that they would raise forecast, but maybe not tweak. Um, they did tweak. The market took that tweak, uh, you know, to be something that was hawkish, which it was. You know, this is another step. The last time they tweaked uh, YCC, they made sure everyone knew it wasn't a monetary policy move. It was more to do with, you know, uh, the functioning bond market. So this one is a monetary policy move. Funny enough, we got the the nod the night before from uh, the Nikkei dropping a piece saying that they were going to tweak, and then they confirmed that. After that, the markets looked, you know, cold light of day. Said, yeah, it is a hawkish move, but it's not rates. Um, it's a it's a small move in the the YCC. They've still got a hell of a long way to go before they start uh, ending this easing cycle. And Juida is not giving up that easing cycle in his comments either. So. That's why we've seen a, a big reaction in, in yen pairs, especially, uh, which we get, we're going to talk about. But yeah, pretty much all is expected. We know where we are with all the central banks now. Two of them at uh, the end of the road. One of them uh, still a long road to go. An incredibly long road to go, isn't it? I think that, yeah, I think the BOJ is probably the most interesting out of the bunch, which I think we probably both called this time last week, saying that it was going to be the, the, the most interesting out of the bunch. I think that the other implication from the Bank of Japan is if this is a step towards policy normalization, if we are going to start to see yields rise more significantly in Japan, what does that do to carry trades? I, I wrote about this um, earlier in the in the day, actually. Um, you know, you've seen this big move into carry trade, short yen, long, MEX, Brazilian real, you know, all of these higher yielders, particularly in LATAM and, and in EM. If you are going to start to see the, the Bank of Japan move towards a, a more hawkish stance, if you are going to see higher rates over in the land of the rising sun, then perhaps some of those carry positions might unwind. And, and that's a catalyst along with normalization itself for, for some upside in the in the yen. But I'm sure we'll, well, in fact, I know we'll get onto that because I've seen the length of your notes for your yen piece in a, in a short <laughs> while. Oh, look, he's having another little dig. You know, you pulled me up about uh, making the distinction between moderate and modest in the statement at uh, the FOMC. And you that's the first line in your note. So, uh, you know, once again, people in glass houses, mate. Indeed. I, I'll tell you what, the man in the tomato red shirt has moved the titles on, so we best talk about potential okay. rate cuts now. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, if we're at the end of rate hikes, what's the market going to be talking about now? They're going to be sharpening the scissors for when are we going to get rate cuts. And, you know, barring a bounce in, in inflation, we are or very close to the peak in interest rates now. So the market is going to trade the cut, and, and once again, it's all going to come down to the data. And what the cut trade will be decided on is who stumbles first. You know, right now there's there's more than a few already stumbling, um, with the US just posting 2.4% uh, Q2 growth from an estimated 1.8% and prior 2% versus countries like Spain, Germany, uh, France, you know, posting 05 0.4, 0.0%, 0.0% uh, growth. We can see clearly who's out in front. So does this mean the US is going to swerve the effects of rate hikes? Um, very likely not um, until the data starts really turning. Um, we're going to be trading the strong versus the weak. Um, that means that even if the Fed does start cutting rates um, because they all want rates uh, down towards their, whatever their neutral level is, um, the dollar could still outperform if it's if it's landing softer than all others. So Trading now isn't going to be like last year and who climbed the rate mountain first. It's going to be who falls down the stairs uh, the fastest, I think. 
Yes, I think you're going to be right. I think the, the only thing I would um, mention just in terms of, of GDP is obviously the, the US give an annualised figure. So when yeah. you, um, you, know, you, you take that out of it, they are still uh, outperforming what's going on elsewhere. You're looking at you know, two thirds of a percent on, a, on an outright quarterly basis. So you know, the, the US is clearly out performing. And I think looking to, to this week, that's really going to be the lens through which markets start to view the PMI numbers. Obviously, we had the, the flash data for, for Europe and for the UK um, last week, and it was pretty poor, to be honest. I think services were year-to-date lows for both, and manufacturing was lowest since uh, the, the early days of COVID, kind of April, May 2020. If we see the, the ISM data in the US starting to diverge from that, I think the market really is going to start jumping on this this bandwagon of, you know, the, the US are going to end up leaving rates at the, or the Fed, I should say, are going to leave rates at their terminal level for considerably longer than we're where this whole idea of US exceptionalism, US economic outperformance will start to build a little bit more. And all of a sudden, you're back over on the right-hand side of, of what we call a dollar smile. And I wonder whether that's why we saw the dollar gain nicely as it did last week, particularly um, after that GDP data, because pretty much everything we're getting out of the US, you look at growth, you look at inflation, you look at jobs. Obviously, we've got the payrolls number coming up later this week. You look at the housing market as well. Everything in the US is pretty much pointing to, towards a soft landing at this point. Everything in Europe and the UK and on this side of the Atlantic is pointing to something that's going to be a, a damn sight harder than that. Yeah, and I don't think we're going to see any any big collapses in any economies. We're not going to see huge uh, drops in activity, but there's going to be wobbles. You know, I've said pretty much all this year we're probably going to see growth plus or minus one percent. Uh, you know, waving around up and down, up and down. And yeah, it's going to be who who shines the brightest. And you've got to put your money on the US. You put your money on the US um, when inflation was coming in and and rates were rising. And you've got to put your money on the US, I think, uh, on the other side of the trade as well. But as mentioned before, if we do get into a rate cut situation, they're not going to be cutting by, you know, 100 percentage points. You know, maybe at most they'll cut down to 3, 2.5, 3% from where they are now. Nothing's going back to zero unless we see complete crap out in the economies. And uh, don't even think about QE um, while they're still doing QT. So even Lagarde mentioned that they can still do QT while they're lowering rates. So they're not interested in in the QE uh, anymore on that front. Yeah, exactly. Although let's be honest, Lagarde hasn't got a Scooby, so we probably shouldn't take what she's saying at face value, should we? No, well, I'd love to see you interview her one day. I would love to do that. I'd have to put a bit of fake tan on first, otherwise getting the lighting right for that interview would be horrifically troublesome. Uh, right, before we get ourselves in trouble with the ECB, let's move on to, well, someone else I'm probably going to get myself in trouble with at some point, which is the good old Bank of England, the old lady. It says five basis points down the bottom there. It should actually say 25 basis points. Clearly, uh, Kiriakos so desperate to get off on his holidays that he couldn't type the slides out right this week. Um, <laughs> in any case, the BOE set to raise rates by 25 basis points this week. Uh, that would take bank rate to five and a quarter percent. Um, obviously, we saw this kind of panic-stricken surprise 20, uh, sorry, 50 basis point move at the June meeting after a much hotter than expected jobs report and a much hotter than expected uh, inflation print as well. I don't think we're going to see a repeat of that. Actually, the, the data started to move in the BOE's favour, um, particularly in terms of inflation, both headline and core CPI surprising to the downside in June. Importantly, services inflation, which we know the MPC is focused very, very closely on, that also starting to roll over. And we should see that continue in July, particularly um, as the, the energy price cap, the, the decrease in that price cap begins to feed into the data. So I think we get 25 basis points from the BOE this week. There's probably enough in the data still for one or maybe two of the MPC. Catherine Mann, perhaps new external member, Megan Green, her first meeting to vote for a 50 basis point move. Uh, the incredible tightness in the labour market and record pace of regular earnings growth may provoke such a move from the Hawks. I think we'll still see Dingra voting for, for rates to remain unchanged, which is just illogical, but I could rant about that until the cows come home, so we will gloss over that for now. I think the, the more important point in terms of the, the markets is what the BOE signal 
going forwards. And of course, there's two ways that the BOE have, have tended to signal their policy intentions in the past. The first is explicitly through the statement. I think they're going to just repeat the prior guidance that if there's signs of inflation persistence, they will raise rates further. And of course, the, the data is likely to show disinflation continuing, at least at a headline level, for the remainder of the year. And the second way that they've tended to, to, to signal implicitly has been through their um, their inflation forecast based on the market's expectations of where bank rate is likely to go. And again, the BOE and their monetary policy report will probably pin 2025 inflation around the 1, 1.2% mark. Does it mean anything? Probably not. I mean, the MPC don't have faith in their own models. So why we should is, is another matter entirely. But I think the crux of the matter is we're unlikely to get anything explicitly hawkish from the Bank of England. And their job on that front has been made a little bit easier by the Fed and the ECB uh, last week, of course. And if you look at what the market's pricing in, we've still got around 85, 90 basis points worth of tightening priced into the OIS curve. I still think it's very, very hard for, for the BOE to live up to that pricing. Uh, and I think the risks to the pound are, are tilted to the downside into uh, Thursday lunchtime. Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, I'm I'm a bit split. I think they could go 25 and indicate maybe there's another on the table, or they could go another panic 50, and then if they did that, I think they'll be done. Uh, I mean, you, you've known my view on rates for a while. Five and a quarter, five and a half is is pretty much my top at the very top top 5.75. But I think that the data is going to go their way. We won't find out obviously uh, the next CPI report until after the BOE. So. They won't know how to react to that. And I can see that number coming down significantly. There'll be the, the July readings taking into account those energy prices coming down again. Um, but we, we do have a presser with it. And uh, that's going to be yeah, a good yeah. thing. At least, at least we get the forecast, as you say, and we get to, well, call it a good thing. We get to hear from what Bailey's going to say. Um, and on the forecasting front, well, you said it. They're, they're not very good at forecasting. So what have they done? They've they've uh, enlisted uh, Ben Bernanke oh. to come and review <laughs> <laughs> to come and review uh, their forecasting prowess. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know what to make of that. Apart from, I can dig up all the old photos from the vault to uh, use on various posts coming up. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think either way, same as the ECB, same as the FOMC, we either get one, potentially one more hike, or we get one hike and we're done. I saw that uh, Bernanke headline when I was out for lunch on Friday afternoon, actually, and I sort of glanced at my phone and thought, hey, what? Is that uh, yeah. right? You know, how, how many glasses of wine have I had at this lunch? I mean, have I, have I time travelled back about 15 years? I mean, the bloke who made an absolute pig's ear of everything coming in to review someone else making a pig's ear of everything. I don't quite uh, understand what the logic is there. But then, Neither you know, he didn't mind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the BOE and logic haven't gone together, well, for this entire economic cycle. So why that would change now, I, I don't know. Although, speaking of lunch, we, I still owe you a lunch for our... Yeah, don't, don't, don't you worry about that. Thank I goodness. haven't forgotten. I haven't forgotten, mate. Uh, once I get all the holidays out of the way, I think, uh, yeah, we might uh, be penciling sometime in uh, September. Oh, I think. Brilliant. I was going to say, yeah, the yeah, rates will be back at about 3% by the time we finally get around the lunch table. That help you pay for lunch. <laughs> it certainly would. <laughs> right. Uh, I think Professor Littlestone has got a little lecture for us. Oh, Professor Littlestone. That's a, that's a wow. new one for me. Yeah. I'll I'll take that you one. need your fancy little professor's cap as well. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, yeah, well, I'd like to drop in a little trading lesson now and again uh, just to change things up a bit. And you know, we've had two really busy weeks. Uh, we've got well, this week, obviously, last week, all the central banks and all the data coming through. Um, I wanted to give some tips on, on how to navigate these big events. Um, and the very first tip I can give is, is know your ranges. Um, there are always big levels that, that hold no matter what got thrown at them, uh, whether it's central banks, data, headlines, you name it. If they can't be broken after things, events like that, then you know your ranges. And it's always worth setting up your ranges going into these big weeks uh, so you can keep an eye on what the price has to do if it's going to go somewhere new and next it helps you not to get caught up in the noise um, which is a bit mixed in with the first point you know take all the events as, as a whole see what the price did prices did did we break the range did we hold the range did we form a new range did we extend the range it's not a job to guess which way markets want to go. It's our job to watch which way markets want to go 
And then again, if they can't get through certain levels, that's what we need to trade them. So finally, now we've even more data dependent uh, in, in these trading weeks now. You can assess a greater number of price moves against your levels, but we can also now start to look for the trends. So if you get a price that doesn't break a level on one piece of bad data, then test it again and doesn't break it on a second piece of bad data, it might break on a third because now we're seeing a trend in that bad data. And if a level gets hit too much, it's likely to break. So the bit of mix you can use there, look for the, the, the big wider ranges, watch what's driving the price to those levels as well, because it's the same thing time after time. And as I say, eventually the price may break eventually. So you can trade these levels. If the price doesn't break, it gives you something to trade against. But if you test those levels, you know, quite often, market might be sitting up for a break. And that's to say, that's just some of the tips I use for trading these events, watching coming out of last week. Have we moved on new levels in Dolly Inn or any other pairs? Not really. So those big range edges, they stay in play. Absolutely. I think you've put that brilliantly and miraculously within two and a half minutes as well. I, I really wouldn't add anything to that. I think you've, you've summed that up very, very well indeed, mate. Well, thank you very much. And that's signing off from the professor. <laughs> <laughs> right. Normal service can be resumed now and that's a setup. Right. The S&P 500. Ryan, how much abuse do you want to give me for this? I don't know. Can I, can I go and pop out and uh, see if there's anything magically appeared in the fridge since the last time I looked while you do this bit? Oh, go on. You won't be missed. <laughs> <laughs> go on, let's, see, let's see what the S&P's done. We haven't heard for at least all oh, one week. Well, exactly. Well, I think it's a couple of weeks, actually. And uh, <laughs> as, as, I've, as I've written presciently in my notes here, Ryan will probably tell me off for bringing this one out again. And that's exactly what he's done. Um, the S&P 500, it will surprise you, I'm sure, to learn that since we've last looked at this chart, the momentum is still with the bulls uh, and the, the price is still continuing to rally to the upside. We tested um, 46.30 last week after the uh, GDP number and, and FOMC, which is the highest since uh, March of 2022. We couldn't quite break through it on a closing basis, but but nonetheless, that still marks itself out as the next upside target. Um, I think there's a couple of interesting developments on the fundamental side of things. Firstly, um, is the fact that the market has remained resilient despite um, the Fed remaining hawkish and despite economic data continuing to come in strong, implying that higher for longer or high for long remains the, the policy mantra. I think that the resilience of the market in the face of that uh, should speak volumes if, uh, if, if you're trading uh, equities. And I think the other point is uh, in terms of earnings season, we've, we've obviously moved through the busiest week of S&P 500 earnings season now. 80% of reports that have come in thus far have beat expectations, which is above the uh, 10 year average of 73%. We are still down about 7% year on year. So that would be the biggest fall since the second quarter of 2020. But nonetheless, things I guess are not as bad as we had first feared. Uh, before anyone thinks I've gone mad and all geeky, though, those aren't my numbers. They've come courtesy of FactSet, who put out brilliant research. I must thank them for that. Um, from a, a technical level, I think. This is still a buy on dips. This is still one to, to play from the long side. If we get through 46.30, then you look for the, the round number above at, at 4,700. And as long as we're above about 4,500, I think this is, is really a market that you don't want to be playing from the short side, particularly with volatility so low, as I'll get on to in a moment. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think uh, you've got to be careful. There's, there's probably a few people who were trading this with a bit of FOMO. Um, you know, it's been a bit of a discussion uh, at, at Forex Analytics, you know, what's going on in stocks because, you know, take something like the DAX where it's, it's, it's breaking record highs again, all-time highs, and you look at the data and think, well, something doesn't compute with what's going on in the economy and what's going on in stocks. A lot of it could be another bit of a dividend chase. You know, markets seeing the end of, of rate hikes, moving their money around. Well, dividend stocks are uh, now worth it to, to, to bank that yield and take a bit of uh, risk out of the, the trade, you know, go for the big companies. Um, but yeah, you know, this is definitely by the dip. You've got to be careful getting in at tops. We haven't seen a decent refresh in this trend, uh, the, particularly the last leg. And that always gets me a little bit of concern. So if you get a decent dip in this, that's potentially one you want to look for. You don't want to really chase it uh, higher from here. 
Right. Uh, speaking of going off to make a cup of tea and look what's in the fridge, um, <laughs> any chance I can do the same? Haven't seen your notes, although actually, complaint time, the Pepperstone snack fridge is empty. I don't know what's going on. Oh, I don't know. You have to you have to take it up with your superiors, mate. Oh, that's exactly what will be done once we finish this recording. <laughs> well, I will uh, get through this in a timely manner. Um, talking about dollar yen and uh, the old plan you trade and trade your plan. Um, last week, the, the the one trade idea I was looking at was I was already long, but I was looking to to turn that long into a short uh, over the FOMC, run it into the Bank of Japan and a and a hawkish, potentially hawkish BOJ. Um, I said I couldn't see them coming out of that meeting uh, anything other than more hawkish than going in. Um, and that's what happened. It was a bit of a roller coaster in the meantime, watching it all. Um, I flipped the long, went short, caught a bit of luck with the Nick AP, so allowed me to, to get a bit of margin in the trade before the, the BOJ dropped. Um, took more off when the news confirmed, ended up uh, out of the rest uh, when it looked like it wasn't going lower anymore and started to bounce. Now, I'm not saying all this because I want to you know, boast about the trade. What I want to show and what I like to show every day is that if you have the right planning, you stand a better chance of your trades paying off. Um, Now, my plan might not have worked. I could have got stopped, but that's the risk we all face uh, when we're trading. But as I mentioned in the last section, I knew where my levels were that guided my risk, um, guided where my stops would be. Um, Bank of Japan pushed uh, dollar yen down to one of the big levels down at 138. It held. That was one of my signals to cut because we couldn't break it. The bounce so far, though, has been very strong. It's put us back over 142, and I think we're seeing the market realising that the, the, the bank have taken one step but have plenty more to go. Also recognising the US data, as mentioned earlier, it's keeping the US on the growth trail ahead of the others. Um, from here, I'm I'm back to watching the data for regards to trading this one. I've got a dip buy and bias on the pair at the moment just because of the bounce we're seeing. And I want to see again, are we going to see the ranges tested? I'll be watching 143 just to get an indication of that. Now we're above 142. Into the mid to high 144s and then up to that big 145 is is the big level to watch. Downside levels, pretty clear, 139, 138. How long was that? Look, the clock's still ticking, see? It it wasn't quite the 30 seconds you said it was going to be, but it was close enough. Um, Question for you, what, what do you reckon drives... The yen from here on in, is it treasuries? Is it risk? Is it the BOJ? What what do you reckon is the the biggest influence on, on dollar yen from here over the, the next couple of months? It's probably going to be risk. It's probably going to be the data. It's, it's going to be everything. I think the, the Bank of Japan obviously got themselves a little bit of a break now um, until their next meeting. The market isn't really gunning up on, on what to expect now. We, you know, We're not talking about further yield curve control, um, you know, in their next meeting. So we've probably got a bit of space for that trade now. We've also got the carry trade. You know, at the end of the day, yes, they've tweaked YCC. It doesn't mean a huge amount for rates uh, in terms of the carry trade. We've still got them on minus 0.1%. We've still got the Fed potentially hiking uh, one more um, 25 pipa. So as far as the, the carry trade's concerned, it's still on the table. It's still very valid. And I think that's been... Uh, behind some of this uh, rally we've seen as well. Um, but risk, as you say, and yeah, we, we're going to trade uh, between the goalposts. And um, all I can do is is just watch my levels. You know, if we get more good data, we get up to 145, we can't get through 145, well, then that's my level I'm going to trade short. And uh, But I'll watch for the break. If we do get a break, um, then it could be significant above that level. God, blimey. And you were saying that Chair Powell was sitting on the fence. God. <laughs> My fence is a bit wide, 138, 145. So I've got I can walk I can walk on that all day long. Park a couple of London buses in that spread. Blimey. <laughs> oh, one once a broker, always a broker, isn't it, as they say? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. That lunch is going up in price, mate. Oh, oh good. Um, right. I better get my expense account uh, improved by the time we go out. Uh, right. <laughs> Let's have a look at volatility. Um, I, I was actually in- initially thinking about putting this in as, as my play of the day, but I, I thought that would be slightly unfair as, as vol products can be a little bit difficult to trade from a, a retail point of view. They are the, the preserve generally for, for right or wrong of, of institutional players. So, 
I thought I'd chuck it in this section instead. Um, there's a lot of talk going around. It, it's a very cyclical thing, this, when the VIX kind of bumbles along uh, at a relatively low level. And, and as you can see on the chart there, we've been below 15 on the VIX for pretty much two months now since the, the start of June. You always get talk that, you know, vol's too low, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of risks going on out there. The market's not taking account of it. Yeah, that's true. You know, there's worries about what's going on in China. There's concern Russia may escalate tensions um, in uh, in Ukraine. Of course, you've got the, the softening uh, macroeconomic landscape here in, in the UK and in Europe and, and so on and so forth. Of course, we're, we're moving into summer as well. Trade typically thins out. You can see larger moves on particularly on, on relatively small catalysts. But I think it's important to remember when you look at something like the VIX, what it actually is. And of course, the VIX is a measure of implied volatility over the coming 30 days. And you've also got other volatility measure, measures, such as realized volatility, which is the, the blue line on that chart. And you can see that realized volatility, which is what has actually been happening, how far markets have actually been moving on a daily basis, has just been dropping lower and lower and lower and lower and lower since the start of May. And it's just collapsed, to be quite frank. And I think when you put it in, in this sort of perspective, you actually start to go, not is volatility too low, but actually is the VIX, is implied volatility too high, given that it is somewhat out of sync with what is actually going on in, in, in the market in, in reality. And I think if you do see, and, and this is not technical analysis before anyone slacks me off for that, but if you do see the VIX move below the, the year-to-date low, which is, is around 12, spot 9, then you could end up in this situation that we've seen so many times before, and, and particularly we saw it um, in the aftermath of the pandemic, and we also saw it in 2019, where volatility comes lower and lower and lower, and that allows more systematic players and institutional players to ever so slightly and an, an ongoing uh, increase their uh, exposure to, to equities. And of course, that then fuels a leg higher in the stock market. And uh, generally, implied vol has a, a, an inverse correlation with, with the equity market. If the S&P moves higher, the VIX will come lower. That will bring uh, a, a greater allocation of cash into, into the market as well. So I think it's just perhaps a different perspective on things. A lot of people have been saying the VIX is too low. I'm tempted to argue it's too high. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, we obviously look at uh, vols a lot in FX markets as well, and, and they've been drifting lower, um, not for dollar yen, which has spiked over, obviously, into the, the Bank of Japan. But those FX vols, you need to keep an eye on because that does bring in, you know, that's when you get your, your tight ranges in between data points or big events and things like that where the market doesn't really do a lot. Um, whether what you're highlighting is is coming into summer trading as opposed to real volatility coming off um, because, you know, there's no risk in the world. Um, I think that might be underplayed. It's weird with the VIX. I would have thought it might have been higher. You know, we're in the middle of a, of a war in Europe and, uh, you know, why it's not trading up, you know, 17, 18, the market ign almost ignoring what's going on in Ukraine and Russia. Um, also, China, Taiwan and uh, everything else going on over there. So, it's strange. I think it's it's trading a bit low for where it should be for the risk events, um, but I can see your side of the coin um, in terms of versus real vol and uh, what what that's signalling day to day. Well, as I say, it takes two to make a market, doesn't it? Um, what about uh, we're, we're in a very giggly mood today, aren't we? Um, we, are, we are. What about uh, WTI? Yeah, well. <laughs> Talking about trading ranges, um, I've, I've pointed this one out a few times. Uh, we, you know, we had when we were trading down the bottom of the range. Now we might just begin to look up at uh, the top of the range, and uh, I've been waiting patiently. This is why I like to make myself a wide market, as as <laughs> Michael likes to put it. But these are the levels you want to be waiting for. We might be getting a move up to uh, you know this this eighty two fifty eighty three area, big solid. Uh, support and resistance area, I've been definite resistance for the last few months going back into last year. We're up close. We have a little bit of a, a minor line around 80, 50, 80, 80. We're over that um, as we're speaking now. So, yeah, maybe we're going to get a test up to that 82 level. Um, you can see it was a big level when we came down from the 120s, hence why I've got a big fat red line on that one. Um, I'm potentially looking to short into that area, just playing the level. Um, above 83.50, though, I'm likely to be wrong. It will look like a proper break is happening. So I might flip any shorts that I've got into longs uh, above there. 
But a uh, level's a level until it's not, as we like to say. Yeah, absolutely. The the other thing um, I think to to note here is we're we're above the two hundred day moving average now which we haven't actually closed above and, and made a decent uh, break above. I mean, you can, you can actually see uh, on the chart there, which I've just really helpfully got rid of from my screen. Um, we, we traded above the 200-day moving average in last August, but we weren't there for particularly long. The last time we actually broke it on a on a rally is going all the way back to the the tail end of 2021, and you can see um, how powerful that move was. The the only thing that's kind of niggling in the back of my mind at the moment when it comes to to crude is yes, the technicals look good, uh, and they they continue to point to to the upside, particularly this kind of 82 and a half, 83 level. If if that gives way, then you think this really might start to to motor higher. The only thing that's bugging me is if you look at the fundamentals, if you look at demand, it still doesn't look great. Yes, things are going well in the US, but where is demand coming from elsewhere? Because China is still in trouble. Europe is still in trouble. And and that's just perhaps uh, a little bit of food for thought for for the bears out there. Yeah, and and it has been said that the the market is moving into a deficit. Um, so it's not that uh, demand is picking up over supply. It's more that supply is falling under demand now, and that's helping to keep the price elevated. But that's to me, that's a sort of false economy. You know, it doesn't suggest that uh, everyone should be piling into oil on that basis because, like you say, and we've seen from the PMIs, manufacturing is in the dumps uh, around the globe, and that's not good uh, naturally for oil. So, uh, yeah, we'll see if uh, we can only trade the prices, only trade the levels. We'll see if this one holds or not. Yeah, absolutely. And and in terms of that level, I mean, you, you can see again from that chart there, it has been a level that's been in place at 82.50 for, well, all of this year and, and much of Q4 last year as well. And as we often say, the, the rule of thumb is, you know, the longer a level is, is a level and the longer it holds, the more explosive and violent uh, an eventual break of that point is, is likely to prove. Yeah, exactly why I would go with a potential flip around, buy stop, buy uh, stop if it does break, and then uh, see where it goes from there. Absolutely. We will indeed. Uh, Right, let's get on to our plays of the day. Right, both looking at the euro this week. I think we're both taking different sides of the trade, though. Uh, Personally, I'm looking at euro dollar, which will pop up on the screen eventually. There we go. Um, I was talking about this last week, actually. I'm I'm not sure whether it was with with Ryan or whether it was uh, on uh, another program I was doing. Um, But I was saying that, you know, you look at the uh, pricing. For, for monetary policy and for central banks between now and the end of the year. I think it was uh, this time last week, actually. Um, the Fed, and, and this is up-to-date pricing, of course, uh, the market price is about a, a, a one in five chance that the Fed raise rates again, either in September or November. If you then look at the ECB, the market price is in, you know, an almost around about a 50, 55% chance that they raise rates once more. And I think pricing of the Fed probably leans a little bit too much to the dovish side, and pricing for the ECB leaves leans, I should say, quite a long way to the too hawkish side. And logically, you would then expect um, euro dollar to to move lower as that pricing corrects itself. And I think last week's central bank decisions helped to solidify my view that the Fed are going to go again and that the ECB are not going to go again, or at least that looks like the most likely path at the moment. And of course, incoming data should help to solidify that view, I would hope. We've got PMIs coming out this week, as we mentioned, and also the non-farm payrolls number on Friday. And I think uh, if we do see another week of very, very solid economic data out of the United States. That's really going to expose some downside risks here in euro dollar. Um, In terms of an entry to to get short, I'd I'd ideally want us to make a closing break below the 110 handle before uh, looking to get in. 109.10, 109.20, that's where those moving averages, the 50 and the 100 day uh, come in. So that would be your your first level. Uh, And then, of course, below that, you've got 107.5, which has been you know, support and resistance for a long time. And I think, in my mind, that feels like a much fairer price for euro dollar to be trading in an environment with a relatively hawkish Fed and a very cautious European central bank. Um, Ryan, I believe that you're taking the opposite of my view. Um, well, sort of. I'm, I'm playing euro sterling for this one. And we know, you know, euro dollar can move and, and euro sterling can do nothing. That's that's the dollar side of things. Um, but this one, I'm looking at an, another buy a dip into 85. Um, it's a trade I'm still in from the first test down there. I'm still long from that. 
Um, I'm looking to add back in uh, to a dip down to the low 85s if we see one. Um, the BOE might be the kicker if they're hawkish. Um, my view of the level being a strong one is backed up by the fact that we couldn't break it just as, as BOE rate expectations reached their crescendo, uh, nor could we really test it as the market unwound the ECB expectations and the, the meeting last week. Um, the historical aspect to the level speaks for itself, a level that goes you know, back years I- I indeed. Um, and a break would need to take out sort of 84.75 to confirm I'm wrong. Um, but hopefully, yeah, uh, if the Bank of uh, England obliged, then um, I'll get another add back into my trade down here and uh, we'll see where it goes. So we can both be right on this one. You can get to uh, Euro sterling moving lower, uh, sorry, Euro dollar moving lower. And uh, then I might get this one moving higher, depending on what the Bank of England does. We can indeed both be right. And that is the beauty of foreign exchange crosses. Uh, we will see this time next week whether we're right or not, I suppose. But that does bring us to the end of another show. Thank you very much, as always, for joining us. Thank you also to Ryan Littlestone from Forex Flow Live and Forex Analytics. And also, of course, to our producer, Kiriakos, who has done this on his last day before he goes off on holiday. He's absolutely desperate to get off to the beach. And, and we've been the ones who have prevented that, him from doing so. So, is that, that a taxi I can hear in the background? Or- <laughs> I think it is. So uh, thank you to Kiriakos for producing it and apologies for keeping you hanging around, mate. Um, all three of us will be back with another episode of The Trade-Off this time next week. If you've enjoyed the show, uh, drop a like on the video, leave a comment as well. Let us know how you're trading the markets or if there's anything in particular you'd like us to take a look at uh, and we will see you all in a week's time. Thanks as always and goodbye for now. <laughs>